It is an exciting weekend. All the stuff that's gone on. Yesterday we had the big giant gospel egg hunt. And when I say giant gospel egg hunt, I mean it. There were 2,000 plastic eggs filled with candy all over this campus. I often wonder if Christ should tarry in his return. And centuries from now, if it's that long, archaeologists come and dig up this area. And they find these old plastic eggs with candies and wonder, are these not religious offerings to some psychedelic plastic chicken? (laughs) But it was an exciting day. We had kids everywhere, parents everywhere, and the gospel was being presented and joy was being had, and over a dozen decisions for Christ have been now recorded. Amen. Amen. And I know many of you, you've been out planning family gatherings and you've been going to the grocery store buying your Easter meal things or perhaps plotting your restaurant visit. And you've been looking forward to this morning as we gather and worship. It's a great day. It's a day of celebration. And well, it should be a day of celebration. But you know, as we reflect on that original Sunday morning, actually, it was exactly the opposite It was not a morning of celebration. It was not an exciting weekend. As we understood from Scripture last week, that Friday, Jesus, after being tried in a kangaroo court, was dragged to Golgotha, the the hill of of the skull, Mount Calvary, where he was crucified for having done nothing wrong other than love people, heal people, and preach redemption. And they took him and they nailed him to a cross and his followers, at the time he had 120 plus followers and his 12 disciples. And many of them the night before his crucified said, we will follow you unto death. And none of them did. When they hauled Jesus off and tried him and the next day crucified him, The only one of his disciples, his apostles, future apostles, was there was John. And John stood there with Jesus' mother Mary as as they looked up at the cross. And Mary saw her son between two thieves. John saw the man that was central in his life for three years. He walked away from his family. He walked away from his business. And they watched him suffer in agony. They watched him being insulted, humiliated, spat upon, and they watched him die. The rest of his disciples were hiding in fear because they had thought maybe they would be next. Peter, the the spokesman, or at least the supposed spokesman, who told Jesus on that Thursday night, I would die for you, Lord, I'll follow you wherever. He denied him three times the night before. No, it wasn't a weekend of celebration. It was a weekend of collapse. It was literally a weekend of grief. And grief knows many, many shades. And all that Saturday after Jesus had been crucified and buried on Friday, you can imagine what was rolling in the minds of Jesus' followers disappointment, disillusion. You can hear the disciples saying, I gave up everything to follow him. Even one of his disciples, Judas, was so angry at him that he didn't live up to his expectations that he, that he, he betrayed him and led his murderers to him. Judas, the Bible tells us, ended up hanging himself. The other disciples cowered in a room. Saturday was the Sabbath. They could not do anything. They stayed. And then the next morning, Sunday morning, while his disciples still hid, the ladies came. God bless the ladies in our group. The ladies came. Another Mary came. Mary Magdalene came to the tomb with the hope of persuading the Roman soldiers to push back the heavy stone so that they could go in and minister to the body. 
so they could anoint it with the seasonings and the spices, so they could make sure it was well taken care of. And they were broken in grief. This was not something that they were looking forward to. They were hoping this Messiah would chase out the oppressors, chase out the Romans, and raise Israel to its true height. But that fell apart when he, when he died. He had told them he was going to be crucified. He told them three times, at least, that we have recorded in the Gospel of Mark and other places, at least three times. He said, they're going to take me. They're going to kill me. They're going to crucify me. He also told them that he would rise again from the dead, but they just didn't quite get it. So they were broken in grief. They went to the tomb expecting to take care of the body. We pick it up in John chapter 20. Beginning in verse 11, the, the ladies had been there earlier and they'd seen the stone had been rolled away. The Roman soldiers were incapacitated. They ran in and they looked into the tomb and they saw the linens where Jesus had laid and what he had been wrapped in. They saw the napkins set aside that covered his face. And they ran back and told his disciples, probably pounded on their door. They've taken him. They've stolen him. Peter and John run to the grave to see what is going on. And they look in and certainly he's not there. John outruns Peter. They get to the tomb. John looks in, sees the trappings of death, but no body. Peter goes into the tomb, sees the same thing. Their faith had been sparked, but they still didn't quite understand, so they left and went back to their own homes. Mary came back, Mary Magdalene. You remember Mary Magdalene? She was the one who Christ forgave for a life of sinfulness. She's the one who Christ redeemed from a demonic influence. She deeply loved him as her master and teacher, as she followed him. And as we pick up the story in John 20, she was just broken. It says in verse 11 of John 20, but Mary, Mary Magdalene, Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping. She was just grieved and she was broken. See, Mary, like the disciples, for whatever reason, that message that Christ gave, that, that epilogue, that afterward that he gave to describing his death was given, listen, I am going to die, they are going to murder me, but I will rise, I will rise again, I will rise from the dead, that somehow they missed that. They missed God's plan for that resurrection. They missed God's plan for the world. Scholar N.T. Wright frames the resurrection of Jesus this way. He says, Jesus' resurrection is the beginning of God's new project not to snatch people away from earth to heaven, but to colonize the earth with life from heaven. That, after all, is what the Lord's Prayer is all about. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus came not just to provide a ticket to heaven, and yes, through Jesus we will go to heaven by faith in him, But he also meant to populate this earth with saved people who will be reflectors of his light, the light of the earth, to be the salt of the world as we looked at in the message from the Sermon on the Mount. We are here as believers in Christ to go out and share that good news of his death on the cross, his burial, and yes, his resurrection. And that's what we celebrate, but his disciples marry They just didn't quite get it. And in this passage, we see Mary's total discouragement. She was feeling that grief. Have you ever felt that kind of grief? Maybe you have. And we think of grief oftentimes when we think of death of a loved one, death of a friend, and we grieve. And well, we should. It's hard. But as I said earlier, grief has many shades. Grief is all about loss. And certainly grief is about the loss of somebody we love, somebody we care about. But we can also grieve over the loss of a job, 
over the loss of a precious family heirloom, maybe not as deeply as a loss of a loved one, but we grieve nonetheless. I think one of the aspects of grief that comes closest to the loss of a loved one is the loss of hope. Just the loss of hope. And I'll tell you, that's, that's becoming rampant in our world today as we see our world spiraling ever quickly away from God instead of toward Him. We place our hope in material things and they fall apart. We place our hope in politicians and celebrities and sports figures and they let us down. But the loss of hope, the loss of a dream is grieving and in Mary and the rest of the disciples, but Mary especially because she had that connection because he had personally redeemed her and forgiven her. He literally changed her life. And now he was brutally killed. And all she wanted to do was render service to him in his death. And when she went and saw the tomb was empty, she didn't celebrate, she didn't shout, she just stood there and wept bitterly. She was discouraged. She was overwhelmed with her grief, not just because she lost somebody she looked up to, but because all of her hopes, all of her dreams died on that cross from her vantage point. It says she stood by the tomb weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. Verse 12, and she saw two angels in white, sitting one on the head and the other on the feet, almost reminiscent of the Ark of the Covenant's mercy seat where at the top where the blood of sacrifice was offered, two angels stood at either end. She saw these two angels in white sitting, one at the head and one at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Can you imagine that sight? But notice this ironic thing, verse 13. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Why are you weeping? Now, they weren't being insensitive. They weren't being cruel. These were angels of God. They knew Jesus had risen. But again, Jesus, his, Jesus' disciples, Mary, others, they just didn't get it yet. And don't look too harshly on them because there are times, <laughs> I don't know about you, but we don't get it either. They asked her, why are you weeping? You look at the response. It said, wow, there are two angels sitting there. No, that's not what she said. She said to them, because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. She was still expecting to find a dead body. She wanted to render service, loving care to his body, and he was gone. Now, now ironically, notice that she's not too impressed with the idea that two angels are sitting there. She's so overcome with frustration and grief because she wanted this last expression of love and it was taken from her is what she thought. So now her grief turns into anger. Her grief turns into frustration. Listen, do you understand that? Do you, do you live that sometimes? I, if you've lived in this world long enough, you've, you've gone through those emotions. Maybe you're going through them now. Maybe you had somebody that you loved and you've lost them. Maybe, maybe you had a hope of some thing or some event in your life and it never came to fruition. Maybe you had dreams that were crushed. I mean, if you look at culture, it seems again like our world is just falling apart. There's a lot to be grieved over. But now Mary was not just grieving the loss from her perspective of Jesus. She was angry and frustrated. Somebody had perpetrated a crime. They stole his body and she was so overcome with frustration that the fact that God's angels were standing right in front of her didn't seem to phase her or move her a bit. And that's what emotion can do to us at times. We can become so emotional, so, so full and fed up that we don't see the signs around us. We don't see the obvious messages given to us. As believers, sometimes even reading the scriptures can seem empty when we're so filled with our own anger and fear and grief. And that's where she was. Mary 
was discouraged. Are you there? Maybe you are, or maybe you know somebody. She just didn't get it. And as she continued on, it says this, as we read further in verse 14. Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. She was just grieving. She was angry. The angels didn't impress her. And she was so fed up and full, she she turned around and saw Jesus, a figure standing there. And notice again, she didn't say, Lord, there you are. The angel said, why are you weeping? So she saw him standing there, but in verse 14, she did not know it was Jesus. Now, commentators have filled volumes with arguments and discussions on why she didn't recognize Jesus. And many of them are compelling, but I'll tell you, Perhaps she was so overcome with her emotion, all the myriad of emotions she was thinking, that she was just too upset to just recognize who he was. I mean, after all, she was expecting a dead body, pale and emaciated, bloody and broken. And here Jesus is standing there, and she sees him, but so full of grief and tears, that her emotionally tangled mind could not connect with the reality in front of her. And we do get that way sometimes as well. She didn't know him. Verse 15, and Jesus then talks to her. He said, woman, why are you weeping? Second time she was asked this. Whom are you seeking? I imagine by this time she was getting a little bit upset about being asked this question over and over again. I mean, have you been in the place where you were upset, where you were angry, and everybody comes, what's wrong with you? And let's be honest, your, your response should, wants to be, shut up and get away from me. Sometimes we're so upset, we're so twisted into ourselves that we're not ready for a pep talk. What's wrong with you? Why are you, you're, why are you so upset? Your life is wonderful. You know, because we as humans, we feel like we have to say something don't we? We want to be encouraging. God bless us. We want to be encouraging. We want to try to help. But I've learned in my time in the ministry, there are some times when better just not to say anything, just to sit with the person and if necessary, weep with them, grieve with them. But the angels of God, why are you weeping? They took my Lord. They took my master. I don't know where they've taken him. There's Jesus standing there. Why are you weeping? Who are you looking for? She doesn't recognize him yet. And honestly, sometimes when we're caught up on our emotions, when we're struggling, when we're having difficulty, and God is trying to get our attention, I don't know about you, but many times I don't get it. Many times I'm so wrapped up in my grief and struggle that that I'm often blinded to God's intervention in my life. I look at our world today. Our world is roiling in all sorts of anger and perversion. We're mad at each other. We're constantly offended at each other. There just seems to be a struggle every time you open the news. And I realize that's the the bane of looking at the news. That's what they do. You know, their motto, if it bleeds, it leads. But it seems like nothing is good. Nothing is positive. Everybody's upset. And God is still here. Christ is still risen, and God is still on his throne, but we just don't seem to see it. I know me, when I get upset and angry, I get blinded too. And here she is again. She came looking for Jesus' dead body, but here Jesus is standing before her alive and living. Woman, who? why are you crying? Who are you seeking? And now notice this as we continue. She's supposing him to be the gardener. She didn't even realize who he was at first. She looked at him and didn't recognize him, thought he was the caretaker, the gardener. And she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. 
She loved him and she just wanted to care for her, his, his body. The last act of love, she thought. Somebody had robbed her of that. And she just begged what she perceived to be the gardener, still blinded by emotion and sorrow. We see Mary's discovery. And blinding sadness can tend to cloud things. But notice this, all of a sudden something changed. Look at verse 16. And then Jesus said to her, Mary. He just spoke her name. Mary. In the Greek, it's Maria. In the Hebrew, it would be Miriam. And it was a common name. Jesus' own mother was named Mary. There were many Marys and Miriams named after the personality in the book of Esther, most likely. And Jesus simply said, Mary, spoke her name. And then notice her discovery. Look at this, that, that sad blindness. Suddenly light appears. She turned and said to him, Rabboni, which means teacher. And more so than just a teacher, but literally Lord, master. It was a term of honor, a term of endearment. Now she recognized him. Rabboni, which is to say teacher. So her blinding sadness became blessed sight, all because he spoke her name, Mary. And as she followed him in his ministry and as he healed her and raised her, she would hear him speak her name. The Bible says in John chapter 10 and verse 13, Jesus said the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name. She was one of his flock. He was her shepherd. And yes, while she was blinded by sadness, tears, when he spoke her name, amazing discovery, light crashed in. All the things that he'd said came true. All of the grief, all of the sorrow, all of the sadness, the frustration, the anger just changed at that very minute. And everything she had hoped for, everything she had dreamed for, all the blessedness of her life suddenly came into clear view. He called her name Mary. If you're a believer this morning and you're struggling, you know Christ as Savior, but life doesn't seem to be what you'd hoped it would be. Listen, I know I'm, I've been there. Struggling with whatever. God still knows your name. God's calling your name at times. He may not call your name out verbally, and specifically, but God is constantly reaching out to us. The Bible refers to him as he's chasing us in the Old Testament, as a, as a, as, as, as a one who hunts, chases. Because God loves you that much. And all he had to say, she thought he was the gardener. She was still cringing and bent over and just weeping. And who are you and what have you done with him? And Jesus said, Mary. And she received blessed sight. She came looking to minister to the dead. And the one who was dead is now living and now ministering to her. He's alive. He's alive. Can you imagine? I, I'm, I, it's, it's just amazing. She, she was so overcome, she didn't realize God had sent angels. I mean, you and I would love to see an angel. That'd be cool. How would you respond if an angel suddenly appeared at your Easter supper today? That'd be something. But she was so blinded she didn't see it. She even saw the risen Lord and at first it just didn't click. Don't give her a hard time because much of what God has revealed to us doesn't click with us either. But we have to be reminded just as she was just now reminded that he is alive, he is risen, he is now living and he loves us so much. Oh my goodness, just imagine being Mary. Your world suddenly fell apart now in the blink of an eye, a split second. Not only is everything back again, but the hopes and dreams are far beyond what you ever imagined. And that's what it is in, the risen Christ. 
The fact that Jesus has risen from the dead, life can be and is now more than we really imagine because here's the thing, this isn't all there is. And the sadness and the grief that we endure right now one day will be replaced through faith in Christ with everlasting joy and bliss. Mary just got a taste of it now in this passage. You and I can also get that taste. Jesus had some instruction for her. It goes on to say after Mary's great discovery that she received some direction. Notice what it says in this passage. It says in verse 17, Jesus said to her, and he said, do not cling to me. Stop there. Because can you imagine when Mary saw him, don't you think she just grabbed him and gave him a big bear hug? I bet she did. I bet she was so happy to see him. Have you ever been so happy to see someone? Or has somebody ever been so happy to see you that they just, they just grab you and engulf you? When I see this, I think of these reunion videos when men and women who have been stationed and deployed overseas come home a little early or come home at a different and surprise their families. Their, their spouses and their children, their family go somewhere because somebody said, oh, go here, we're doing X, Y, and Z, and they don't know that their, that their military personnel have come home. And can, have you ever seen those things? Oh, my word, they're just amazing, just so oh, so full of emotion. There's hugging and clinging. And I imagine Mary was just so blown away, happy and thrilled and just overwhelmed. And she just grabbed him and held him. And Jesus said, don't cling to me. The old King James says, touch me not. But the literal Greek is, do not hang on to me. Do not cling to me. For I have not yet ascended to my father, but to go, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and to your father to my God and to your God. Jesus was giving her instruction, first of all, there's going to be a new relationship. Yes, Jesus is bodily risen from the dead, but he wasn't going to be on the planet much longer. It was now time for him to begin setting up what later would become the church of Jesus Christ. And it was time for him now to appear to his disciples and to gather them together and instruct them on what is coming. She didn't, he didn't want her to cling to her because, yes, soon he would be leaving. He'd be ascending into heaven. He would send his comforter, the Spirit of God, to come and then indwell in them the Holy Spirit. And the church would be sealed with the presence of God through the Spirit. And no, we cannot touch God and we cannot hold God and we cannot cling to him. And I'll be honest with you, there sometimes I do wish God would come down from heaven and just wrap me in his arms, don't you? There are sometimes I have prayed, God, can you just come and hug me? And maybe God has sent somebody, a, a spouse or a friend, to come and give us a hug. But Jesus said, look, don't cling to me. Things are about to change. There's a new relationship coming. Instead of having me here with you personally, I'm going to ascend into heaven and sit on the throne next to my Father and rule and reign as Lord. But I will send my Spirit. So tell my, tell my disciples, my brothers, and this is the first time in the New Testament he calls the disciples his brothers. Because there's a new relationship. They were his servants. They were his disciples. And in John 15, he even called them friends. But now through Christ, his death, burial, and his resurrection, he calls them brothers. Because there's a new relationship. And listen, you and I who know Christ as our Savior, if you've trusted Jesus, you are his brother, his sister, in, 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 his, in his family through his blood. Romans chapter 8 says we are joint heirs of all the riches of heaven with Jesus Christ. Because why? He's alive. He's risen. And now there's a new responsibility. She said, go, he said, go tell my brothers that I'm ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. So verse 18, Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. There's now a new responsibility to go and tell. The new relationship is Christ has ascended to heaven. He came to do all that he was going to do. The Bible says earlier that the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. He has come to serve rather than to be served. But now the situation has changed. Now you and I who are believers filled with the Spirit of the risen Savior are to go out and share this good news to the world. So that people who are struggling in grief and sorrow, brokenness and lostness can find that same 
wonderful discovery of Christ as Mary found, as you and I found when we got saved. So we see Mary's discovery, Mary's direction, and now Mary's discouragement was destroyed. That responsibility is echoed as Christ was leaving the earth in Acts chapter 1 when he'd finished his earthly ministry. He said, you receive power. After that, the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. It started with Mary. Mary going to tell his disciples. As we look at Mary's direction, uh, Edwin Bloom tells us that she received four graces at this time. She was the recipient of these graces, and these are, first one is to see angels. Now, she didn't get it. She didn't notice them, but she saw them. There are a lot of things we see that we don't get, a lot of things we see we don't remember. People get fascinated when they find out I was born in Japan. Well, I don't remember Japan. I left, man. When I was about two or three months old, they got me out of Dodge and brought me to America. I would love to have been able to remember that. I love, I love Asian food, y'all. I would love to have those memories. One day, maybe God will give me grace to go back. But listen, Mary got to see angels. She's one of those few in Scripture that have got to literally see them. Even though she didn't catch it, she probably realized those were angels. Wow. She got to see angels. She got to see Jesus risen. It was not enough that she experienced his earthly ministry and witnessed him dying on the cross. You and I can only imagine that. But she saw Jesus risen again. What we celebrate 2,000 years later, she saw firsthand. Not only did she see him, but she was the first to see him alive. That's the third grace. She was the first to see Jesus alive. The disciples, Peter and, and, and John, went to the grave, but they just saw the grave clothes. Mary Magdalene was the first to see Jesus alive. What a grace that is. And then also she had the fourth grace to be a proclaimer of the good news. We don't see that as a grace, do we? Sometimes we see that as, I don't know, some Christians see that as a drudgery. Some Christians fear it, but that's a grace given to us by God that he's commissioned us to share the good news of his resurrection. That's why we're still here. That's why, as N.T. Wright said, we're not plucked up immediately when we're saved to go to heaven. We are left here to colonize and to share the good news. That our Savior died on the cross for our sin. He was buried and three days later he rose again from the dead. As a matter of fact, uh, Edwin Bloom goes on to say, Christians today are also the recipients of special grace, unmerited favor, that we too are given this new responsibility to witness to the world. I mean, today we're gathering to celebrate the resurrection of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is alive. And by the way, I've said it before and I'll say it again. There, are, there is no historical moment that is more um, proven than Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. There's more historical attestation to these historical moments than many of the things that we hold as historical, but really may or may not be. Jesus is alive and we can prove it. And just like Mary, we get caught up in the frustrations and the, and the fumblings of this world. We get caught up in the grief and the sorrow and sometimes we, we, we drop our eyesight and we lose our focus. But it's days like today where we're reminded, now we don't see angels and we're not standing at the tomb, but listen, Jesus Christ is alive. Buddha is dead. Muhammad is dead. Jesus Christ is alive and living. And we've gathered in his name, so therefore he's in our midst. If you don't know Christ as Savior, I beg you to place your faith and trust in him today. Oh, I know maybe you came and you, if you didn't know him, you think, oh, I'm going to go to church or I've been, going to, I've been doing this, I've been not doing that. Somebody might come up and say, where would you go when you die? Well, I hope I'm going to heaven. I'm trying to get to heaven. I think we all want to go to heaven, but I got some good news for you. Heaven has been bought and paid for by the Son of God. We celebrated his and commemorated his death on the cross last Sunday. He broke his body and shed his blood so that you might have life eternal. He died and took the blame for all of your sins, past, present, and future. 
to try to add to that by our own works, our own religion, our own supposed goodness, we insult him and we cheapen his payment. Jesus, the old hymn writer had it right. Jesus paid it all. And we come to him in humble faith as we, yes, we, can, we confess our sin. We realize our sin. We own our sin. Knowing that we can never save ourselves because of our sin. And we cast our full faith and confidence in the crucified, buried, resurrected Savior to save us and give us everlasting life. If you've never trusted Jesus, do that now. Do that today. But if you know Jesus, you found him. He's alive. Why are you weeping? Why are you struggling? Yes, life has its issues. Chuck Swindoll said this as we finish. He said, the devil, darkness, and death may swagger and boast. The pangs of life will sting for a while longer. Yes, life is tough. And even believers suffer difficulty and grief. We struggle, and sometimes we sit and weep. But the key is to know that the end of the weeping, through Christ, everything that is wrong will be made right. Everything that is bad will be made good. Everything that is lost will be found. And we will then walk with him forever. So at the end of the day, like Mary, why are we weeping? Ask that, why are we weeping? We planned that child to do that just for this moment. <laughs> the devil, darkness, and death may swagger and boast, but the pangs of life will sting for a little while. But don't worry. At the end of the day, don't worry. The forces of evil are breathing their last. Doesn't seem like it. I know that. It seems like they're, it seems like they're getting worse and stronger. But one day Christ is coming back and will put a stop to it. And as we studied in Sunday school this morning in, in Philippians chapter 2, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God. We win because Christ has won. Don't worry, the forces of evil are breathing their last not to worry because he is risen. Amen? Amen. We have life. Through Christ. When Christ left the earth, he left the church with some ordinances, two ordinances. We observed last Sunday communion or what we call the Lord's Supper. Where we took of the juice and the bread to symbolize his broken body and shed blood. Internalize the price that he paid for us on the cross. And today as we finish this morning, we celebrate our risen Lord by observing the ordinance of baptism. Now, baptism and the Lord's Supper have no saving qualities. These are left for believers to observe. The Lord's Supper is an inward work to help us to remind us of what Christ has done for us. Baptism is to show publicly what Christ has done for us. So we baptize in a setting like this so all can see. And as we take the baptismal candidate who has professed faith in Christ, we take them down into water because Jesus died. And in a sense, when they come to know Christ, they die to all self-effort to be saved and to be glorified. And we bring them up out of the water cleansed and Christ rose again from the dead. And this is symbolic of the fact that when we receive Christ as our Savior, he cleanses us from all sin. And so I'm excited to do this today because, again, this just speaks of new life, clean life in Christ. So we'll have a word of prayer, and then we'll have our baptismal candidates come one at a time, and we'll rejoice in their decision. Let's pray. And our Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you for this day today. We thank you that Jesus is alive, and because he's alive, Lord, we have life eternal. We have hope our grief has been destroyed. Our sorrow has been strangled. Lord, our, our, our sadness, it's gone. Because no matter how bad it gets here, we always have you with us. And one day through, through Christ, we'll be with you. So Lord, as we observe this ordinance of baptism, maybe, may we be reminded of that new life. Christ was buried in death 
but he rose in life. When we come to know him as Savior, we, we died our own personal efforts to try to save ourselves. And through faith in Christ, we rise in new life. I pray for these candidates who are coming to demonstrate that, that they have received Christ. And may you get the glory for it. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.